um, say one word, cell phones, please turn them off. We have a trip on May 9th, and the bus, we have enough people on the bus to make the trip um, break even, um, but there is more room on the bus if anyone has a friend and would like to um, join us. The annual meeting is the uh, 27th, the week, uh, the, the not next Friday, the Friday after. There are printed um, list of the candidates. So remember, there is a slate of uh, candidates. People who come to the meeting can offer other members to, uh, that, that are just dying to be on the board and can't wait to be treasurer or president or something like that. So you can certainly um, make a motion. But um, I encourage you to come to the annual meeting because you will hear um, reports from our committees and how well the committees have done and whether this organization is going to be viable or fall apart. So um, come and find out. Um, there is also a sign-up sheet because one of the benefits of the annual meeting is that you get to eat goodies prepared by some of these wonderful cooks sitting out here. So if anyone is willing to make some lemon bars or chocolate chip cookies or brownies or something to share, because after the annual meeting we will have time to socialize, have some something to drink and, and um, have a sweet, and then the lecture will start at two o'clock. And now Patty Motch will introduce our speaker. Orion Lewis received his undergraduate degree in international studies, Phi Beta Kappa, at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and his PhD in political science at the University of Colorado, Boulder. He's an assistant professor of political science at Middlebury College and the Middlebury Institute of International Studies at Monterey. He works on integrating the two institutions and developing new learning models via experiential learning, both in, on campus and in country, such as field work in Asia. He's interested in questions of state-society relations under conditions of authoritarianism, the role of information technology in changing social organization, and foreign policy. He's the author, most recently, of four related works published in Chinese and Asian political science journals on, one, authoritarian evolution in the controlled Chinese press, two, Incentive to Innovate, question mark, the behavior of local policymakers in China. Three, the political economy of noncompliance in China in relation to industrial energy policy. And number four, net inclusion, the new media and deliberative democracy in China. He's currently working with a colleague from Remnin University in Beijing on the role of personality and media choice in shaping political ideology in China. Today's presentation is Authoritarian Evolution, How Commercialization and the Internet Are Fragmenting the Chinese Public Sphere. Dr. Lewis. Okay, um, well thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Patty, for organizing. Uh, this talk that I'm gonna give today is based off of two projects I've been working on. One uh, is an article I published last year on kind of changing media uh, and commercialization and how that impacts uh, what's going on in China. And the other uh, looks at both personality and media choice and tries to understand the evolution of political ideology in China. So, uh, lights or presentation? So when I, when I lecture or talk, I like to try and involve the audience. So I may ask you questions. They told me 
uh, that you're supposed to have microphones, but we'll, we'll do our best uh, to make this as interactive as possible. If you have any questions, feel free to interject at, at any point. Um, I think this work is interesting. Uh, if you think about, say, what's going on in American politics today, we talk about kind of political polarization. Uh, and a lot of that is an argument about the internet and how it's created kind of different information environments uh, within the United States. And China is really an interesting test case, right? Because China is a strong authoritarian regime. Uh, it's spent a great deal of resources on censorship, media management, and control. Uh, and so it's what we would call a hard test case for uh, the role of media or the internet in kind of creating political fragmentation, right? People grow up in an education system that's heavily uh, indoctrinated, they're heavily indoctrinated. Uh, there's a big push to get people to think in the way that the government wants them to think. And so if we see diversity of viewpoints within China under that system, uh, then we can be pretty sure that those kinds of processes are certainly taking place elsewhere. Uh, so I think I want to, you know, paint a picture of you for you in terms of uh, China today. Uh, and everybody knows about economic development and China's rise, uh, but I think most people don't really fully understand the complexity uh, that exists within Chinese society. That we think of everybody wearing Mao suits and singing Mao songs and, uh, you know, looking similar and the kind of communist archetype. Uh, and China today is really very different. And this is a good example uh, of these pictures of these kids. Uh, does anyone want to venture a guess as to what they're doing? Uh, they're protesting, right? Uh, and this is an online protest. Uh, the signs that they're holding up say Nanjo uh, Jiao, uh, which means let's go Nanfang Jomo, which is a, a, a major newspaper in southern China. Uh, and they had written a editorial for the Chinese New Year uh, that said that they wanted to make an editorial called The Dream of Constitutionalism. Uh, they're really making an argument about rule of law and, and the idea that China should move towards more of a rule of law. And that editorial was actually censored by the publicity department, also known as the propaganda department. Uh, and the journalists basically went on strike and made a protest about it um, and got this information out there. And you saw kids all over the country kind of basically doing this, right, online social movement in support of free speech and free thinking and the rule of law, right? And so this is something we don't often realize exists. It exists a lot uh, within China. So what I want to do today is I'll give you a little bit of background about media commercialization. I'll try and not make this too social science-y, but uh, hit the key points. Um, I can talk about the implications for political pluralism within China. If we have time, I'll say, I'll say a little bit about how the government itself is responding to this political pluralism, and, and then we'll open it up for some discussion. So the core question that I'm asking here is essentially, what is the role of commercialization and new media, which I define as all forms of media that usually exist online and are not part of kind of traditional broadcast or print media? Um, and how are these things reshaping state society relations in China? So let's start with media commercialization. Technically, all media organizations, newspapers, television stations, et cetera, are controlled by the state. The party always has the editor or the head of those organizations is always a party member. Um, and so it still exists under this process of kind of state control. There is a propaganda department that doesn't censor everything beforehand, but it does provide some kind of uh, post-publication censorship at times. So we think of Chinese media as being heavily state controlled, but what has happened over the years is that instead of the state subsidizing all of these organizations, they now have to rely on the market, right? The government told them you have to make money and be profitable. So what does that mean for what a news organization is going to do? Well, how might that impact their behavior? Well, if you think about what the, well, think about your own market. <laughs> How does marketization and commercialization drive changes in, in our news media? 
It means you're going to get a lot of different types of models, different types of behavior, people are trying to become profitable in doing so. In China, it means a couple of other things, too. It means that you now have two masters, right? You have the state and you have the market. And it may not be that those things are always in total congruence, right? There, sometimes there is a profit motive to doing things that maybe the government doesn't want you to do. Uh, and so you see a tension in these two kind of logics of, of media production uh, within this public sphere. And what I argue is that essentially what has happened is that traditional kind of party propaganda, you know, the People's Daily where everything is highly choreographed and there's a bunch of kind of Orwellian, you know, party speak in it, that that is not really viable from a market standpoint. Most people see through that and consumers really don't, they don't buy it, right? So most people say, like, if I, I don't read the People's Daily. I only read it if I want to know what the government is thinking, right? But that kind of traditional propaganda doesn't play in, in a marketplace of ideas. People want sometimes more accurate information. Sometimes they want more entertaining information. Uh, and so what you see is a diversification of media models that exist that on the one hand, you have a number of people that are trying to fix the propaganda system and move away from this kind of very stultified language, very formulaic, uh, to have more of a kind of professional orientation, but still manipulate it in a way that it's uh, considered what I, what I would consider to be party propaganda. So that's what I call party minimalism. I've interviewed editors where, where they say, you know, my goal is to you know, help explain policy in a way that kind of average citizens understand, right? Make it more relatable, uh, more professional, et cetera. There are uh, sensationalist models, right? So just one way to navigate this is to engage in tabloid, tab you know, tabloid uh, news, you know, uh, National Enquirer type sorts of things. Um, and that's basically avoiding political risk, but still being kind of commercialized and entertaining and, and, buy and profitable. There are other models here where there is an effort to kind of become more professional and push the boundaries of what professional journalism can be within China. Uh, and that really falls into two categories. One I call shielded professionalism, which is you want to kind of be critical of policy. You want to kind of push change a little bit. Uh, but you're going to use the party's own rhetoric and, and ideas to kind of shield yourself from, from criticism, right? So you frame your argument as being consistent with policy X, Y, or Z. Um, and so you can't be punished for that. There are others, like the, uh, the Southern Weekend that I started off with, that have really been known for kind of pushing the boundaries of critical journalism and professionalism. And very often their editors get fired. Uh, I think that one organization has gone through like 17 editors in, in the last you know, decade or so. Uh, so they get punished, but they, there's still an idea of professional journalism uh, that continues to, to uh, move forward. And so my basic point here is that commercialization creates a diversification of media models and a diversification of content, and it creates some degree of choice uh, in terms of media. And this is just an example of a content analysis that I did in, in my article last year. These are five different newspapers where I sampled editorials, kind of coded them based on the topics that they were covering. Uh, and these are what I consider to be sensitive topics, either kind of highly political topics or international foreign relations sorts of topics. What you see here is that there's significant variation across these different newspapers, right? You have some Beijing papers that um, are considered to be more kind of boundary pushing sorts of organizations. Um, you see that uh, the, this is a paper in uh, Jiangsu province, which is known as being more tabloid. Right? And so you, the basic point here is that there's differences between these organizations. And I think that's one thing to take away. We think of China as this kind of very monolithic sort of place. Like everybody is the same. Every news organization should be the same. Um, and it's really not. Second point here is about the internet and how the internet is changing communications and social organization. And there's a lot of questions about the implication for control and authoritarian control, right? That the internet was designed to be this radical 
decentralized network to facilitate information. Uh, and actually, organizationally, if you look at how the internet is structured, it was designed to be resilient uh, to control, right? There's not one master switch that you turn on and off, but it was designed to be an open, decentralized network. So there's a lot of questions about this, right? If you have an authoritarian country that's based on top-down hierarchy and control, why would you ever embrace the internet? Well, if you're North Korea, you're not, <laughs> right? Um, but what we see is that for most countries other than North Korea, they have embraced the internet to a certain degree, and China very much so. One of the reasons is economics, right? That the internet is not just communication, but it's also technology, it's an economic platform, it's seen as if you want to be successful in a modern, globalized economy, you have to have this infrastructure uh, in order to do so. But there are implications for control. And this is what we would call the autocrats or the dictator's dilemma, right? That on the one hand, you want the internet and new media for economic purposes, but on the other hand, you don't want the kind of political liberalization that might come about because of it. And so the question is, how do you kind of manage that? And I would say that there is an autocrat's dilemma for good reason, right? If you look at, say, the Arab Spring, and the role that new media played, a lot of times it's talked about as Facebook revolutions. Uh, I think that's a bit overplayed, but it certainly does play a role in undermining authoritarian control at times. But people like Morozov have noted that this is also based on kind of liberal utopianism, right? That we have this idea that if you just give countries the internet, uh, that they'll all free themselves and become vibrant democracies, right? Give, give the Cubans the internet and social media and somehow the regime will collapse. Uh, and he argues that this is really you know, not a totally accurate picture of the world, right? That governments are able to use the internet as well and they are able to control it as well. So China is a really good case in that regard, that the Chinese have always structured the internet in a way that they can control it, right? There's only a few points of entry in and out of the country. Um, they can shut down certain parts of it if they want. They have keyword filters on all the data that's sifting through their networks, made by Cisco Systems, the best that money can buy, right? Uh, so the Chinese are an exercise in trying to maintain control over the internet. Uh, and they've spent more resources than any other country in doing so. China has also had rapid growth. So they were a late adopter for the internet. If you go back to like 1990s, they had hardly any internet connections at all. You see here about 50 million internet users in 2002. But starting around the middle of the last decade, you see this kind of rapid upward trajectory in terms of growth. If you fast forward to even just a couple years ago, this number right here is 731 million people in China have internet access. Right, so that's the penetration rate of about 53%. If you have a country of 1.4 billion people, uh, you still have some, some ways to go. Right, so China has grown dramatically in terms of its uh, access to technology, uh, but there's still uh, some room for development. Yes, ma'am. I was just wondering how reliable their access is because I was wondering, I mean, there is access, but even in Beijing, how reliable is that connection? Uh, Pretty reliable. Uh, so in my experience, it's pretty, much pretty easy to get internet access uh, anywhere you go, like all the coffee shops and hotels and everything. Um, actually, most people access the internet on their, on their cell phones now. Um, and so they have very fast cell phone networks um, and, and it's pretty reliable. Uh, if you're saying how easy is it to access, there are some constraints there. So now, for example, it used to be that I could go to an, a, a coffee shop and just get on a network. Now they always want you to have some kind of ID number. So they're trying to do a lot with kind of 
registration and identification uh, of users so that they know who the end users are, right? That's one way of overcoming the anonymity uh, of the internet. Uh, I'll talk about this quickly. You know, th there are a lot of, when you think about what we would call the great firewall or the net nanny, uh, people think that this is like one, one certain thing, but really the whole system of control is based on kind of multiple concentric circles of control. And a lot of it's about kind of the technical enforcement, right? So the keyword routers that would automatically filter out content uh, that they don't want. There's legal regulations, so all internet service providers like internet cafes or other internet service providers are also uh, responsible for regulating their own content. So internet companies themselves, our uh, internet sites themselves go in and regulate content, right? It's not just the government doing this all of the time. Uh, there's human enforcement, so you have a, a publicity bureau, propaganda bureau that monitors things and, and censors content. Uh, and you even have other aspects to this. So it's not just about preventing uh, discourse, but now it's also become about shaping discourse. So there's actually a whole army of people that the government pays to post content on their behalf uh, in various social media sites. And we call them the, the 50 cent army because they get 50 cents for every posting that they make uh, uh, online. Right? These are not people that work for the government, they're just getting paid by the government. Uh, and so you see that China has been very savvy in kind of adapting these new methods of control and, and public opinion management. I would argue that it's also because, you know, as much as we like to say that they totally control public discourse online, uh, it's a very complicated thing to do when you talk about the total amount of information that's out there, 731 million users. Uh, and so a lot of times, what I would argue is a lot of the things that the government is doing is a reaction to kind of political liberalization that has occurred because of uh, new media and new technology. So in terms of our study, uh, we asked two questions here that relate to what I've been talking about. The first is about individual personality. So some of my work is focused on uh, kind of evolutionary biology and uh, theories of cognition and personality. One of the questions here is about how personality might impact the choices that you make in terms of what type of information to consume and what type of information you're going to believe in, right? And one of the things that we found in political psychology is that there is a kind of inherent individual level distinction that explains your political ideology. Uh, in the Western context, we talk about differences between liberals and conservatives and the different types of cognitive patterns that they have. Uh, we would say that uh, conservatives tend to want uh, a certain degree of certainty uh, and uh, liberals want, have a need for cognition, right? They want more ambiguity and, and uh, discussion et cetera. So this has been shown to have clear correlations with political ideology, just based on who you are at a basic individual level is going to shape what your political beliefs are. What we argue today is that it also shapes the types of media that you choose and the types of information that you're going to believe in. So our methodology, I'm not going to go into this too much, but we did an online survey of internet users in China. We distributed this to multiple different forums. We're trying to get as representative of a sample as we possibly can. So we tried to send it to more conservative leaning forums, more liberal leaning forums, uh, et cetera. We have more than 10,000 observations from internet users in China, which is a pretty good number. So first, slide here really looks at kind of the distribution of ideological placement. I'm not going to talk too much about how we, we measure this, but we have kind of a battery of questions which we use to uh, plot ideology. We also have respondents kind of self-identify themselves. And in China, the extreme left 
the, the extreme left is the conservative position, right? So the government is communist, uh, that, and so the, we consider the, the left uh, to be conservatism, uh, that it's more uh, adherent to the state, whereas right is more kind of reform oriented, right? So the right are the people that were protesting for uh, openness and free speech, et cetera. One of the things that we find is you see a greater proportion of internet users are on the liberal side of the spectrum as opposed to the conservative side of the spectrum. And we have some explanation for why that might be. Uh, but it is important to note that we have consistently found more respondents to be liberals than conservatives in our studies. We had a battery of questions to measure what we call authoritarian personality, right? So this is really thinking about what types of personalities facilitate authoritarianism. And generally, this is about kind of deference to hierarchy, right? Uh, that you're not kind of questioning authority, you're going along with authority. And you can see the questions that we uh, ask in order to measure that. Government leaders are like the head of a family. We should all, we should all follow their decisions. Uh, even if a parent's demand is unreasonable, children should do it. Uh, it's taken for granted that subordinates should submit to a higher ranking person. Right? So all of these questions are kind of different ways of getting at kind of deference to hierarchy. So we measure kind of personality, how, how authoritarian is your personality versus um, how reformist or, or, or liberal. Uh, and we also look at kind of media consumption, right? So the different ways we look at media consumption are between official media. So do you consume kind of official party mouthpiece sorts of media, uh, like the People's Daily uh, or uh, the nightly news on television is also highly controlled and, and official in nature? Or do you consume what we call unofficial media, right? The more commercially oriented, the more aggressively professional uh, sorts of news organizations, and information online, right? So this is a multivariate regression model. Um, basically what this shows is the effect that these different factors have on one's ideology. And so the negative numbers here means that it is having more of a conservative effect on their ideology. And anything over on this side means it's having more of a liberal effect on someone's ideology. And the OME is official media exposure, right? That's how frequently and how often you consume official media and the UME is unofficial media exposure. So the two things that are notable here is, first of all, official media exposure has a very large and significant effect on a person's ideology, less so than unofficial media exposure. And secondly, that authoritarian personality is also highly correlated with a more conservative ideological position. Uh, whether you're a party member, age, gender, some of these things also matter. Uh, but our test variables here, the things we're really interested in, are all significant. So you see these are kind of confidence intervals. None of them touch the zero here. That means that they're considered statistically significant factors in explaining ideology. We also looked at this a different way. This isn't a kind of political science research methods talk, but one of the things we did was we used a different way of modeling, which not only allows you to look at the relationship between your test variable and your outcome, but also the relationships between your different explanations, right? So we can look at the correlations, not just between personality and ideology, but also the interaction of personality and media choice. What this shows here is, as we saw before, Authoritarian personality is strongly correlated with a more conservative ideology. But you see a couple of other things. So there's a direct correlation here, but there's also an indirect effect as personality is channeled through media choice. Right? And what this says is if you're more conservative, you're much more likely to uh, consume official media. And that has a significant 
additional impact on your leftward leaning trajectory ideologically. Conversely, you see a similar pattern on the other side. Uh, more anti-authoritarian personalities are more likely to choose unofficial media, and that again correlates significantly with a more liberal-leaning ideology. So these are our findings, and what I argue is that there's basically a siloing effect, which means that people segment themselves into different information silos. When we talk about the increase in political polarization within the United States uh, or other Western countries, a lot of times it's an argument about the diversification of our media landscape and this idea that people are now self-selecting into different information environments so that it's not just that you have differences of opinion, but you also have complete differences in terms of the information you're exposed to uh, and how that impacts the opinions that you have. And what's interesting about this is that this is not in a liberal Western democracy. This is under a system of control where there is a state that is trying to push everybody uh, in a conservative direction for the most part. So this is important, right, because it explains an increase in kind of what I would call political pluralism, right, that Chinese society is not monolithic like we often assume, but there's actually a diversification of political viewpoints within China, and that under conditions of media choice, it may be that that diversification is actually growing, right? That, that, that because you now have greater information choice, there is this kind of greater divergence in public opinion within China. So what does this mean? Um, well, it means that the government has to really think about how it reacts to this. So I want to give you a couple of examples in terms of authoritarian responses. Right? So if the government now faces a much more kind of complex information environment, much more complex ideological environment, what does it do? Right? How does it respond? How does it decide uh, to exert its control? And there's a couple of studies out that help to explain a few things. So the first one is by Gary King at Harvard. This is a, a pretty uh, well-known study at this point. Uh, but they look at online censorship within China. They have very complicated uh, algorithm that they use to look at content. But they really ask this question, what does the government censor and why? And I think by looking at what the government chooses to censor, you can get a sense of what are they really concerned about and what are they not so concerned about. And one of the things you see is that they don't always censor criticism, even criticism of the, the government. Uh, that the idea that you can't criti criticize the state uh, or that you don't have freedom of, of speech in that regard is really not entirely accurate, right? If you have a very complicated public sphere online, you have to pick and choose what you censor and what you don't. And sometimes there's an argument that for an authoritarian government, actually giving people a voice online and letting blow off steam is a good thing, right? They feel like they have more freedom, they have more voice, uh, but it doesn't really necessarily have any kind of, uh, you know, real impact on, on your ability to stay in power what we call a, a release valve, right? A release valve on the pressure cooker. What they do choose to censor is things that can lead to social unrest and social mobilization, right? And that tells you something, that uh, what they're really worried about is kind of, you know, disgruntled actors going into the streets, right? They're worried about the point where online uh, criticism becomes uh, offline criticism in the streets, right? And I would argue that when you look at what the Chinese government does uh, across the board, really, their main concern is regime legitimacy and staying in power. So anything that is seen as a central threat to their ability to stay in power is what they really censor. So we talk about Tiananmen, Taiwan, Tibet, and there's an X, which is Xinjiang, Xinjiang province. Uh, so those are like, you know, if you go search for Tiananmen Square on the Chinese internet, you're not going to find it, right? You're going to find like tourists looking at maps in Tiananmen Square. Um, you know, so that tells you something. Those are all things 
that would fundamentally threaten the government's legitimacy and its ability to stay in power. Uh, you can see this elsewhere. So I have a, this is actually a student of mine. I think she's now at the MIT Sloan Business School, but she wrote this really great senior thesis where we also did a study of what the government censors. And we looked at Sino Weibo, which is essentially the Chinese version of Twitter, uh, kind of microblogging site, very popular. Here you see a picture of Xi Jinping on Weibo, the, the current president or uh, emperor. Um, and basically what she did is she did a ge kind of geographic analysis of what's going on in terms of censorship. So sh we looked at, I think, something like 65,000. These are all, this is a database of, of posts that had been deleted by the government, right? So we were only looking at things that we knew had, had been deleted. I think there are 65,000 of them. Uh, and you see some interesting trends here. Right? First of all, that they're, they're very concerned about Beijing. <laughs> Obviously, it's your capital. You know, of, of course, you would be very focused on what's going on there. Uh, but you see kind of the, this is also a development story, right? Shanghai, Guangdong, the richer provinces have a higher degree of censorship. That makes sense, too, because they um, also uh, have a significant number of users. But you also see places like Tibet, obviously, is a core concern for them. Uh, that they're worried about. If you look at topics, what are, what are they censoring? Uh, questions about freedom and democracy uh, occupy a large portion of this. Uh, ethnic grievances, environmental grievances, and grievances about corruption, right? Once again, mostly things that uh, relate to either government legitimacy or could potentially threaten the government in terms of kind of social unrest. So we see a lot of protests about environmental problems. If you've ever been to Beijing, you would understand uh, because it's like walking through a smog, claw, cl a smog cloud uh, every day, right? So like I don't, I don't want to take my five-year-old son to Beijing uh, because of the pollution. So you see a lot of unrest over environmental issues. Uh, corruption, and also these ethnic, these potential ethnic mobilization uh, campaigns in, in Tibet and Xinjiang. You see some different patterns in this, too. Um, one of the things I think is really interesting, right, so you see like Hainan province is the Hawaii of China. Uh, they obviously have more kind of environmental concerns. Uh, but you see some differences between, say, the Uyghur movement in Xinjiang which is really uh, has a high proportion of kind of ethnic identity claims, as opposed to Tibet, which is, has a high proportion of kind of freedom and democracy claims. So those two movements in and of themselves are talking about their movements in different ways, right? That the Tibetans are framing this as freedom and democracy, whereas the Uyghurs are really making this about kind of ethnic identity. Uh, so there's some interesting patterns there. So, what the final takeaway here is that authoritarian repression in China is much more kind of multifaceted and is different than the kind of authoritarian repression you might think about during the Cold War, right? That it's not quite as heavy handed uh, as it used to be, that there are avenues for free expression, right? So really focus on this kind of core issue of regime durability. If you can't censor and control all information, you have to focus on what's, you know, the core issue for you as a state. Uh, but what we, what we see is kind of expanding opportunities for expression. And I've done a lot of interviews with journalists. Um, you know, they always say, I'd, I'd always ask, you know, do you feel like your freedom uh, of expression is more or less than it was 10 years ago? And it's always universally, like, we have way more opportunity for expression. Uh, as journalists and editors, right, that we can talk about issues that we couldn't before, right, environmental concerns, public health concerns, right. There is this kind of limited watchdog role for, for the media within China, uh, and, and it's not all just about control all the time. Voice, greater voice uh, for citizens, you know, one of the things about the internet is that it's a user-driven platform, so you're giving citizens the opportunity to voice themselves. Um, and that could be dangerous if you're 
you know, Egypt or Tunisia, but it can also be beneficial if you're able to kind of keep that thing uh, in a box, right? You're giving citizens a, gr a greater sense of freedom. And this is what uh, Rebecca McKinnon calls the gilded bird cage, right? That there's still a cage in China, but maybe that little cage is more like an aviary uh, or it's a little bit bigger. Uh, and what you see actually is citizens feel like they have a sense of, of freedom uh, because that aviary is much bigger than the little bird cage that they used to be in. Um, and so there's also a criticism of that and that it's still an aviary, right? There's only, there are still uh, places that you can't go. How are we doing on time? Um, I'll give you a couple of examples here that I think are interesting. Um, you see that one of the ways that authoritarian control has changed within this environment is that the government is not, cannot completely control information and discourse, and so it has become more kind of proactive and, and changed how it engages in control. Uh, and so what this means is that they actually study like media management theory and uh, you know, think about how the United States say, you know, United States government tries to kind of manage media discourse. Uh, and they've become more proactive in terms of kind of marketing and spin, right? So that it's not just about this kind of blunt, you know, hammer of propaganda that's, that's you know, hit, hits you on the head every day but that the messages that they create are more subtle uh, and more savvy in terms of how they try and do it. Uh, and so it's more like you don't realize that there is a mechanism of control behind it. So an example here is what I call the Google incident. Uh, this happened a little while back when Google exited China. Uh, but basically, uh, Google claimed that it had been hacked and that some of its data had been stolen. It probably was. Um, and what they did is they went public with it, right? That they basically said, government hacked us. Uh, and they said, we are no longer going to censor our search engine in China. So once again, every search engine has to kind of self-censor. Uh, and so they made this kind of very public statement, basically taking on the government very directly. And this is a sensitive issue, right? Because you're taking on the propaganda system or the system of control, right? That's another thing you don't want people talking about. Uh, and so what you saw was that they tried to block all discussion of this uh, on the internet and in the media, but that information still got out there, right? That you can, you, you know, hundreds of millions of people, you can't control everything that's out there. And so you had citizens in, in Beijing going to Google's office and laying white flowers down on their sign because white flowers are a symbol of mourning, right? Uh, and, and so you had these kind of very dramatic sorts of things taking place. And so if you can't control it, what do you do? You're gonna spin it, right? And so these are some examples. This is from a very nationalist uh, newspaper called the, um, the Huanqiu Shibao, the, uh, the uh, the kind of international foreign policy newspaper. And they essentially, not only did they start covering it, but you see they have like a whole page, right? They have, the whole page is devoted to the Google incident. You can come over here and, and voice your opinion and, and take, some, take some surveys. So uh, they had chat rooms and they had these surveys. But if you look at what they're saying here, it's structured in a way that's very clear, right? Um, <clears throat> So the first question is, do you think the Chinese government should accept Google's demands to operate under uncensored conditions? Uh, and then the second question is, do you think Google's actions constitute an infringement on China's political sovereignty? <laughs> right? <laughs> um, this one, I, I like this one too. Do you think the Google incident, who do you think the Google incident harms the most? Google, the United States government, Chinese internet users, or the Chinese government, right? So the implication is very clear here. They want to spin this as this isn't just about Google taking some kind of principled action. This is a nefarious plot by the United States and Western countries to infringe on China's political sovereignty, right? That's the, that's the narrative that they're trying to build. But they're not just 
banging you over the head with it. It's in the context of you freely expressing your opinion, right? So it's a good example of how they've kind of changed what they do to become more, more savvy. I think Xi Jinping, the current president, also embodies this to a very large extent. If you know, I don't know how much you pay attention to China's political system, but generally the leadership is like very boring and technocratic. Uh, so Hu Jintao, the previous president, was like one of the most boring people you've ever seen in your whole life, right? Um, she has totally flipped the script on that. He is a populist to a very large extent. And a lot of what he does is in a, popul a populist orientation, right? So you see him on social media looking, looking suave in his leather jacket. Um, he'll, go to, he'll go to like a dumpling restaurant and order dumplings and carry his own tray and sit down at these cheap dumpling restaurants and like talk to citizens. Right, like that's very, very different from what the leadership in China has traditionally done. Uh, and so you see this as well, that is kind of reforming the image of the leadership to make it more palatable, more populist, uh, and more popular. I think he is popular uh, to a very large extent. This is not so dissimilar from what we see with other authoritarian regimes. I think Putin in Russia is a good example of this. If you remember our friend Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, uh, he was a master of kind of media populism, right? Using the media to build kind of a popular view of yourself, right? He had a show called Allo Presidente uh, that was basically a variety show that he would come on and sing and dance and talk about whatever. And, uh, you know, it was paradigmatic of his use of media to become kind of an authoritarian populist. So this is the environment that we live in now, that we have a much more complicated and complex information environment that has much more, uh, has a very large impact on kind of political pluralism and ideological diversification. And it also has an impact on how governments navigate this, that I would argue that information age is a challenge to authoritarian states, that we do see change happening and that they are responding to that uh, in a way that is very different from the kind of Soviet Union or China of the past. So this is where we are, and um, uh, I'll end there, and I'm happy to answer any questions. In one of your slides a while back, it showed that both gender and age were factors, but it didn't say what gender or how age impacted it. Yes, yeah, so um, I'll, I can tell you right here. So, um, so male, so the male uh, is associated with greater, uh, more of a liberal position in this study, and the age group is that, uh, also some, I think this is really interesting, actually older citizens tend to be more liberal in orientation, whereas younger citizens are expressing more of a conservative ideology. And, and this actually, I think this is one of the really interesting puzzles about what's going on in China today, that uh, the youth in China are very cosmopolitan. You know, they grew up in an information age, they talk about going to Middlebury College and Harvard and wherever. Um, so they're, very, they're extremely worldly and cosmopolitan. At the same time, they're much more nationalistic. And, and I've always found that hard to believe. Like, they are globalized citizens, and yet they're also more nationalistic. Uh, and that's really a puzzle that I don't, I can't fully understand. I think it's a lot to do with kind of national patriotism and pride in China's rise. Uh, you showed on your on the screen uh, Shanghai was a largely internet controlled city, but I could I watched the BBC all the time and I got a New York Times and there weren't holes in it. Were you staying in a um, international hotel? Sure, but so were my friends and my Chinese friends and they would come to my room. We watched the BBC. So that uh, is that controlled? 
Um, so that's a good that's a good point. It's actually not as controlled because it's in English, first of all. So they're much more interested in the Chinese the Chinese language uh, sorts of sources. So like if you were going to watch, I don't know if you watch the nightly news in China, but it is highly choreographed. Um, so so no, I think I think in general we would say English language sorts of things are not as tightly controlled as Chinese language sources. Uh, they're not worried about foreigners rising up in the streets. <laughs> well, they do. I think that's also that's also a good example of how they can't control everything too, right? Because Chinese people speak English, they can have access to that. That's going to resh reshape how they think. There's a lot of sources online where they will take. New York Times articles or The Economist and translate them into Chinese, right? So you can actually find that information in Chinese on the internet if you know where to look for it, right? And that happens all the time. Uh, yes, I have a question. Setting aside political science, which you've been saying that they protect strongly, the, under the internet, can the Chinese people quest for knowledge? Not political knowledge, just knowledge with all the spectrums that it can bring them. Yeah, so this is one thing I've, I've looked at. When I, I lived in Beijing in 06, 07, and um, I ended up reading a lot of academic articles in Chinese. And I was always pretty surprised at how open and critical they were. And so I always kind of viewed it as, well, if you're at more of an elite level, there is greater freedom of questing for, for knowledge, right? If you're in the university or you can speak English, uh, and that the real control is on the what we call the Lao Bai Xing, right? The the old 500 names, right? Where they they're really more concerned about the the masses, right? Masses of people, not the elites. So I've always thought that elites had more of kind of a privileged position uh, within the system, and that there was greater opportunity to quest for knowledge, as as you say. I think if you look at you know the top universities, I was at Beijing University. Um, they always had like top international scholars going through there, right? So if you're Beida, you know, you can talk to pretty much whoever you want, and that's not controlled at all. Um, one thing I would say is that that is changing, right? So Xi Jinping, part of his, one thing I, I would say is that he has been engaged in a process of authoritarian rollback over the last few years. I think it's very clear. It's actually become much harder. I'm, I'm going to Indonesia this summer because it's become much harder for me to do work in, in China. Um, and part of that authoritarian rollback is uh, something that we saw in the past, which was like guard against uh, you know, subversive bourgeois liberalization. And, and so the, he's directed universities to not have as much kind of Western academic resources, right? And so there's, this was, I think, something we saw continually in the 80s and you know, this kind of pushback against westernization. Uh, and he's doing that again today. I, I didn't think I'd ever, we'd ever see that, but he is, he is trying to do that. Whether or not it can be done, I don't, I don't know. I interviewed the head of the communications university and asked him about his curriculum. He said, yeah, we study kind of Marxist theories of communications, but most of what they did was kind of western media theory. Uh, so I, you know, I think they're definitely trying to do this. I question how successful they'll, they'll be at it. So I have a couple of questions about the censorship. <laughs> about the censorship. Do you think the average Chinese person understands that what they are able to access online or in print media or whatever form has been filtered? And do they constantly have the sense that they're not getting the whole picture, or do they not realize that? I think they do. I mean, I think, um, you know, again, I, I think it depends on who you're talking to. You know, I tend to talk to more, I think, politically aware sorts of individuals, but you know, everybody I talk to, they know full well that they're under a system of control. It's not like it's something you don't ever realize. Um, and so they talk about it and, they, and you know, they understand, like part of their choice is based off of that, right? So I interviewed a um, very 
kind of aggressive, the, the Economist of China, and they said like 18% of their audience was government officials because the government officials wanted like a more unvarnished sort of information. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, one of my friends is a major in the PLA, and she said I would never read the People's Daily <laughs> uh, unless I just want to see what the government line is. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to think about this in two ways. I think one is people that are kind of politically aware do know about this. But there's a lot of what's called bread, bread and circuses taking place and distractions. And so there's a lot of people that just are not engaged in, in that at all and don't even think about it, right? They're playing, they're playing video games. They're watching Desperate Housewives. Uh, you know, like there's like a mass, uh, you know, a mass opiate that, that is out there that I think also distracts a lot of people. And that's also very uh, important functionally for the state, right? They don't want people to be engaged. They want them to be kind of distracted, but it also gives them a sense of freedom, right? They say, how am I controlled? I can download, you know, any Desperate Housewives I want. Uh, <laughs> you know, I have greater freedom, right? So, so I think if you actually look at public opinion, that's one of the parts of why the regime has been successful in, in being so durable is people do think that they're freer than they used to be. Mm -hmm. And the deal is basically we give you freedom of choice socially, you know, a lot of things you can say, you know, talk about anything. Um, there's much greater freedom uh, of, of thought and discourse. You just can't cross these, you know, remaining red lines that we want you to stay out of. And that's generally politics. Here at the back. Um, you mentioned Tiananmen Square. I'm here at the back. Okay. And um, next year is going to be the 30th anniversary of that event. Um, do you think that the Propaganda Bureau is already sitting, deciding how they're going to spin all the news that's going to come out of Western media? You said the Chinese know it as a geographic destination. They don't really know it as uh, the iconic thing that it was. So will they learn something, or will it be censored and blocked? Uh, that will be one where they, they do everything to block that. Um, and they do that every year, every year on June 4th. Uh, they, they're always looking out for uh, Tiananmen uh, information. So that's something they gear up for on an annual basis, not just on the kind of 30-year anniversary uh, sorts of, of things. And, um, yeah, it's, it, that is kind of Orwellian uh, in, in some sense. Uh, there's some good videos out, that are out there where somebody is interviewing these Chinese students in the United States, and they show them the kind of tank man photo and ask them, you know, what is this? And they, none of them know what it is. Uh, so that is, that is one area where that is such a politically sensitive sort of issue that they will go all out on that for sure. My question is that you said it's, make, it's more difficult for you to go to China now and you're going to Indonesia instead. What is it that, that's difficult? What, are you not allowed to ask certain things? Are you afraid you're going to be jailed or imprisoned or something? Or do you just not feel comfortable? No, it's not, it's not that quite that bad. You know, like I've never been, never been tailed by, I've never had a, Public Security Bureau come talk to me or have tea. Um, it's more about access and the ease at which you can access people to talk to you. So I'll give you an example. Uh, I did a project two years ago where we took a number of Middlebury students to China to do field work. And we had a project on vocational education, which I don't think, it, to me, was not particularly sensitive sort of topic. Um, and we were in Hangzhou, and just before, they were getting ready to have a G20 meeting there. And Xi Jinping had told everybody to beware of uh, foreign spies posing as academics. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was super hard. We had a successful project, but it was really hard to set up interviews. Um, I think in part because we were coming as a big team, too, was a little bit different. But we had to get, we had to really pull a lot of strings in order to get the interviews 
that we did. And we had to work much harder to get people to talk to us. And so it was possible. We did it. We have a good project. Um, but it was just tiring. <laughs> like, it just took me a lot, of, a lot of time and a lot of effort. Uh, and it was clear that people were much more on edge about talking to us in ways that they weren't before. When I, did, I mean, I did my dissertation on media in China, which is a pretty sensitive topic. And I did over 100, 120 interviews. Um, and it was not hard to get people to sit down and, and talk about this with me, and sometimes in very open ways. <laughs> Uh, and I, so I was always kind of optimistic about China that even though you have sensitive topics that, you know, there's a saying you can say anything you want as long as it's around the dinner table. Um, that's sort of changed a bit. So I think for me it's more of just the ease of, to which you can talk to people um, and the amount of effort you have to put into a project. Do, have you been to Indonesia? Do you think it's better there? Yeah, absolutely. You think it's better? Then? Yeah, and Indonesia is a consolidating democracy, right? So Indonesia went through a democratic transition in 98. Um, by all accounts, they are uh, consolidating as a democracy. So it's very pluralistic, multi-ethnic society, and um, they have a moderate form of political Islam. And so I, I have a lot of contacts there, and I'm expecting it to be much easier. <laughs> Do you have any indication that Chinese students who have been here and studied and returned to China, and when they were here, of course, they did learn about Tiananmen Square, or at least our version of it, that they are harassed, controlled, uh, threatened in any way? I mean, they can't forget what they've learned when they came here. What happens to them? Uh, I, you know, I, I don't think anything happens to them, to be honest. Uh, you know, I have a number of former students that are living in China right now. Um, you know, I think they're always trying to balance what they've been taught growing up with what they learn in the West. And we, I had a, some students did a project on this, and it does impact them. So they, they talked to a lot of Chinese students at Middlebury. And they did say, like, being exposed in, to Western thinking and ideas does impact my, my viewpoints. Um, but I don't think there's any effort to kind of harass them when they go back. There really is personal freedom in, in China. It's really as long as you don't, you know, as long as you're not like organizing a labor movement or something like that, then, then you're generally fine, right? So as long as you're not involved in politics, you can think whatever you want for the most part. Um, so it is interesting. I worked with a student from Vietnam uh, last semester too, and she said to me at the end, she said, I just realized that everything I've been taught was controlled and, <laughs> and managed about Ho Chi Minh and, and all of this stuff. Um, and so it was really interesting. Like, I had gone through a whole semester of political communication with her. She has this, like, dramatic revelation at the end. Um, so it, it is interesting. And, and there are, there's increasing numbers of students studying outside of China, for sure. So um, how they manage that is, is interesting as well. Thank you all very much. This is very interesting. Yeah.